Hello, my name is Zymina Chavis. I am the president of the QCC Mock Trial Association. Michael Rawls, Jamie Andrade, and I will be the co-moderators of today's program. I would like to welcome you to our Law Day program entitled Commemorating the 50th Anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, co-sponsored by the Queensborough Mock Trial Association, the Office of Student Activities and Student Government. We are very fortunate to have with us today a panel of QCC faculty and staff members from the business, social science, and history, speech communication, theater arts, and human resources and labor relations departments who will discuss various aspects of this very important statute and effects it has had and continues to have on our society and on the lives of individuals in our nation. At this time, I would like to introduce the members of our panel. First, we have Professor Peter Bales. Second, we have Professor Stephen Hamill. We have Professor Kathleen Larkin, Professor Leslie Francis, Professor Linda Meltzer, Professor Joseph Dubowski, Professor Christine Mooney, she couldn't be here today, Prof um, Lois Florman, Esquire, Professor Ted Rosen, and Professor Elaine Thompson. Thank you, hold your applause. <laughs> no, no, you did, a, you, you did a very good job holding your applause. <laughs> Law Day. Law Day, May 1st. Today is a day set aside nationally to celebrate the rule of law. Law Day underscores how law and the legal process have contributed to the freedoms that all Americans share for over 50 years. May 1st has been the day set aside to celebrate Law Day. Law Day is aimed to help people appreciate their liberties, especially with respect to equality and justice. It also aims to cultivate respect for the law, which is vital to the democratic way of life, supported by organizations such as the American Bar Association, this day is an opportunity for people to recognize and discuss the role of courts in the United States. To celebrate Law Day, some local bar associations may hold a luncheon with guest speakers on various legal topics relevant to modern society. Law Day activities may include fundraising events and tasks, community outreach activities linked with talking points about the law, poster and essay contest tests, um, interactive school lessons and role plays on legal topics such as the concept of separation of powers and the United States Constitution. Law Day originated in 1957 when the, when, when the then American Bar Association pre President Charles Ryan envisioned a special day for celebrating the United States legal system. On February 3rd, 1958, President Dwight Eisenhower established Law Day by issuing a proclamation Every president since then has issued an annual Law Day proclamation. In 1961, May 1st was designated by joint resolution of Congress as the official date for celebrating Law Day. According to, legal inf according to the Legal Information Institute, the president is requested to issue a proclamation calling on all public officials to display the flag of the United States on all government buildings on Law Day, and inviting the people to the United States to celebrate Law Day with appropriate ceremonies and other appropriate ways throughout public entities and private organizations and in schools and in other su suitable places. Previous Law Day themes included justice for all, foundations of freedom, and struggle for justice. Now, this year's Law Day proclamation issued by President Barack Obama reads as follows. More than two centuries ago, patriots battled to release America from the grip of tyranny. As these brave citizens defended their right to shape their own destiny, our founders created a government of, by, and for the people, rooted in the belief that, that just power derived from the consent of the government. It is a system that can only function through the rule of law. This law day pays special tribute to the right to vote, the cornerstone of democracy, 
Many Americans won the franchise after generations of struggle, while others gave their lives so their children and grandchildren might one day enjoy what should have been their birthright. Thanks to women who picketed the White House and activists who marched on the National Mall, our laws finally recognized a truth that had always been self-evident, that every citizen should have a voice in our democracy. Over the centuries, we have made legal changes that eliminated formal voting restrictions based on wealth, race, and sex, and that extended the right to vote to younger adults. Today, our laws continue to protect this fundamental right. Laws like the Voting Rights Act, the National Voter Registration Act, the Help America Vote Act, and the Uniform and Overseas Citizens Absentee Voting Act. Despite this hard-fought progress, barriers to voting still exist, and the right to vote faces a new wave of threats. In some states, women may be turned away from the polls because they are registered under their maiden name. In others, seniors who have been voting for decades may suddenly be told they cannot vote because they do not have a particular form of identification. As we reflect on the trials and triumphs of generations past, we must rededicate ourselves to preserving those victories in our time. Earlier this year, a bipartisan commission appointed and recommended a series of common sense reforms to protect the right to vote, curb the potential for fraud, and ensure no one has to wait more than half an hour to cast a ballot. States and local election officials should implement these recommendations. In addition, the Congress should demonstrate its commitment to our fundamental right by updating the Voting Rights Act. Let us mark Law Day by recognizing the institutions that uphold the rule of law in America. Let us vow to keep safe our founding creed. Let us, let us remember that opportunity requires justice, and justice requires the right to vote. Now therefore, now therefore I, Barack Obama, President of the United States, in the, of the United States of America, in accordance with the public law, 87-20, as amended, do hereby proclaim May 1st, 2014, as Law Day, USA. I call upon all Americans to acknowledge the importance of our nation's legal and judicial system with, with appropriate ceremonies and activities, and to display the flag of the United States in support of this national observance. In witness, where, in witness whereof I have hereunto set my hand this 30th day of April in the year of our Lord 2014 and of, and of the independence of the United States of America, the 238. <coughs> Now, let's turn to today's program on the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The federal law that made prohibited discrimination in public accommodations, employment, and education. Our first speaker is Professor Peter Bells. Professor Peter Bells received his bachelor's degree from Northwestern University, master's from Long Island University, and PhD from the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Prior to his position at Queensboro, he taught at Nassau Community College, CW Post College, and the State University of New York at Farmingdale. His research interests include 20th century U.S. diplomatic history and United States, Latin American relations. Currently, Dr. Bills is working in the realm of U.S. political history and writing a book focusing on the unsuccessful presidential candidates of the 1920s. Professor Bills has published a, a humorous take on the United States history, which evolved into two books. How come they always had battles in the national parks? And who cares? They're all dead anyways. Recently, both books were combined into a comprehensive tongue-in-cheek chronicle of the American saga called A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the 21st Century. The factual yet irreverent survey of American history from the beginning throughout the modern era has been, a popular, has been popular with students and comedy fans of all ages. Professor Bells will speak on American history from post-Civil War up to the 1950s as it relates to civil rights. 
Please hold all questions until the end of today's program. Thank you, that, that's my cue. Sorry for the long bio. Uh, I, I deliberately took out the part about how I went to camp and some of the things that I did there. But uh, thank you for coming. Thank you to the Mock Trial Association for inviting me and every organization that's sponsoring this. I thought your remarks were right on target and I agree with you 100%. I've got seven minutes to set the stage for the events that will directly lead to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So strap on a seatbelt is history at 95 miles an hour. But let's set the stage. And uh, welcome to, well, first of all, welcome to all of you. I really hope we've got a bunch of future lawyers here. And uh, I just want to say that the law and the subjects I teach, political science and history, are very, very, very close cousins because it's all connected. Now, you all know about the unspeakably evil institution of slavery that uh, infected this country even before it was a country, the colonies and then the new, new United States. Slavery, slavery fastens itself upon this country. And uh, most Americans will probably be accepting of it. If you were to ask a New Yorker in 1800, what do you think about slavery? The New Yorker would have been likely to say, that's ah, the South's business. We do business. You know, uh, what's the big deal? But that's changing. Abolitionists that you've studied in other classes made a difference, speaking out against slavery as a moral wrong. And by 1830, 1840, that average New Yorker is not going to say, ah, forget it. It's no big deal. They're going to be starting to be angry about slavery on moral and ethical grounds. And it'll get more and more intense as you go through the 1830s, 1840s, and 1850s. Slavery split the country. You know that. We had to fight a civil war to determine whether or not the states had the final say when it comes to a law, or the federal government, or the central government. And the issue that forced that issue to the fore, the nature of the federal union, was slavery because the southern states wanted slavery and they were worried that if the northern states in Congress could block the extension of slavery to the new territories, well then the next thing they're gonna do is take slaves away right here on my wonderful plantation in Virginia where I sit on the veranda and drink mint juleps while the slaves do all the work. The Civil War was fought in large measure because of slavery. And you all know the North won. Dare I say we, we're in the North, but that was a long time ago. And the North won. And slavery was abolished in the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. And other amendments followed. The 14th Amendment, equal protection under the law. The 15th Amendment, guaranteeing uh, the right to vote for African Americans and others. However, what really happened after the Civil War was, yes, African Americans were freed. But where do they go? What do they do? The North lost interest in Reconstruction in just a few years and basically pulled out of the South in order to appease Southern Democrats in a fraudulent election of 1876. Reconstruction ended. The blue troops, the Northern troops, pulled out of the South. And once the white Southerners got control of their state governments again, they instituted a segregated society that would last, well, some people say it's still in many ways lasting to this present day. A segregated society, segregation, the separation of the races, if you can imagine such a thing. And many African Americans wound up as sharecroppers, which is barely better than slavery. Uh, you know, you're, you have a piece of land, you rent it from a, from a white owner. Uh, you know, you, you pay your rent in, in uh, what you grow, barely enough left over for you and your family. Poverty is what sharecropping was for African Americans in the South for decades and decades and decades after the Civil War as sharecroppers. Now, in the 1870s and even early 1880s, um, a lot of African Americans were allowed to vote in the South because both parties thought they might get them on their side. But that ends in the 1880s. 
As the Southern Democrats realize African Americans want to vote Republican, the party of Lincoln, Lincoln freed the slaves. African American, very few of them can vote, but when they can vote, they vote Republican. Of course they do, Lincoln freed the slaves, Lincoln was a Republican. So the South is going to clamp down on voting for African Americans and, and pass what are called Jim Crow laws to stop African Americans from voting. A poll tax, can you imagine a fee for voting? How about a literacy test? You have to read in order to have to pass a reading test in order to vote? The grandfather clause. If your grandfather wasn't eligible to vote, then you can't vote. Well, in 1885, everybody's grandfather had been a slave, and that's a way from preventing African Americans from voting. Racial gerrymandering. Gerrymandering happens today when political parties uh, draw districts to favor them. Can you imagine doing that to favor the white race over the black race? Well, they did that in the South to make sure that whites always outnumbered blacks in a voting district. Whites only primaries where African Americans could not uh, participate in the selection of candidates. Shocking stuff, but it happened in America's melting pot that is better referred to as a boiling cauldron. Now, as we go, this continues, this fastens itself upon the American South and the North is no picnic. And we go through the 19th century into the 20th century and African Americans will be in a segregated South. World War I, which the US got into in 1917, will open up lots of jobs in northern factories, and there'll be a mass migration of African Americans who want to get off those farms. Uh, they will come to the North for jobs in the factories, and they'll meet some resistance to uh, coming North in the, in the white neighborhoods, but they will be coming North in great numbers. Harlem, a white farming village in 1890, is the center of black culture in the 1920s, the Harlem Renaissance, I hope you study in history class. Uh, the 1920s, African Americans bring jazz to the world. The 1930s is the Depression, and that hit everybody. African Americans and whites and everybody. Now you know the Democrats in the 1930s had the New Deal, government programs that reached out to the poor and reached out halfway to African Americans. In the 1930s, African Americans who since the Civil War had voted Republican switch en masse to the Democratic Party, a switch that is still in place today. And understand the reason why approximately 90% of African Americans vote Democratic in presidential elections is because, thank you, is, uh, I'll, 90 seconds, is because um, the Democrats reached out to them halfway, at least, in the New Deal of the 1930s and have ever since. Uh, 1940s, World War II, more migration to the North, and African Americans in segregated units in both world wars excel as soldiers and, and in the Navy. Um, and i leaving off in the 40s as African Americans are demanding in small court cases and getting big victories sometimes demanding an end to segregation. Uh, they're, they've, they've moved en masse to the north, and they are demanding and, and challenging in court segregation as you go from the 1940s into the 1950s. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Professor Stephen Hamill. Professor Hamill is a graduate of Nassau Community College Hofstra University and Turo School of Law. He is admitted to practice law in New York and Connecticut and in the federal district courts for the Southern and Eastern District of New York. He has practiced law in New York and has substantial experience in real estate, including in particular title insurance issues, having served as counsel to Chicago Title Insurance Company. Professor Hamill began teaching at Queensboro in 2009 and teaches business law, business organization and management, finance and marketing. Professor Hamill was one of the faculty advisors to the QCC Mock Trial Association and to the Stock Market Club. Professor Hamill will talk to us about the 1950s life in America under segregation and Jim Crow laws. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. You can hold your applause also. <laughs> Um, you know, the 1950s were, were a very exciting time in the United States. Um, but, but we're going to talk in this section about 
the upcoming civil rights revolution and the Jim Crow laws that were still in effect, shockingly, at this point. Most of us, when we look back on the 1950s, you know, we think about the, I don't know, the movie images or, you know, the, um, the images that are portrayed in, in, in various TV shows, you know, being that the war had ended, you know, the, the GIs had come back uh, only a few years before, you know, they decided that they wanted to settle down and have quiet, peaceful lives. You know, President Dwight Eisenhower was in the White House and Americans were leading a level of prosperity that had never been seen before in the country. You know, manufacturing and, and incomes were going up, the standard of living was increasing. It was, really, it was really an amazing time. The housing market was taking off, you know, in part modeled after Abram Levitt's model, which I'm sure many of you would know as uh, Levittown. You know, that was a new idea in housing and it, it spread across the whole country. It, it gave people a level of, uh, li a, a type of lifestyle that had not been really experienced before. You know, we had all types of new music, as uh, Dr. Bales had you know, spoken about briefly. You know, we had rock and roll, rhythm and blues, country, name only a few. The radios all played music with stars of, you know, like Chuck Berry, Elvis Presley. I'm sure most of you don't know who these people are. <laughs> but Nat King Cole, Dean Martin, Chubby Checker, Richie Valens, Patsy Cline, Ray Charles, Little Richard, and Frank Sinatra, of course. And it was just a, just a great time. However, you know, based on all these great things, there were also significant challenges that the United States faced. You know, the Cold War was in full swing. You know, with Russia, there was a lot of, a lot of tension. Many, many people were very concerned about that. You know, the wave of prosperity didn't extend to all Americans throughout this country. There were pockets of poverty in the inner cities and uh, very urban areas. Appalachia was in very bad shape at that point, still is a lot of it. You know, but most importantly, the, the promise of equality was not realized, you know, for many Americans. It was, America was divided racially and segregated in many places, and inequality was, un, unfortunately, a fact of life. You know, segregation existed in many places in, in the U.S., not as much in the, in the North as uh, in the Southern states and some of the other states, um, but still, it was a huge problem, and it was compounded by the decision with Plessy versus Ferguson from 1896, where Plessy uh, thought he could win his case, but in fact, it turned out that the uh, separate but equal uh, proposition of existence here in the States was uh, affirmed. So that, ex that extended well in, into the, uh, into up, up until the decision of Brown, which is some 80 some odd years, I guess, uh, later. So separate but equal said basically, look, if we separate the races, it's okay so long as the separation is equal. But as we all know, separate is not equal. Generally what happened was, you know, things were not separate but equal. In fact, they were terrible. Uh, so we, we had these challenges that we faced. But in the 50s, you know, it was an amazing time because, I don't know, somehow the, the public consciousness was awoken. And it came, to the, it came to the forefront in the 1950s. Names that had previously been unknown, locations, phrases, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., Brown, Topeka, Rosa Parks, Montgomery, Alabama, segregation, and Emmett Till had become household names and topics of discussion in every household. And it started this national discussion about what, what in fact we felt as a country, as a society, you know, and, and how we were going to change, uh, change this, you know. So this, this was a, a pivotal time in the United States. Many feel that the catalyst or the spark for the movement occurred in 1951 when the father of a little eight-year-old girl living in Topeka, Kansas, challenged the law along with other parents which required his daughter, Linda Brown, to travel to a distant school rather than a closer school due to her race. This action, of course, resulted in the landmark case of Brown v. Board of Ed decided in 1954. It overturned the Plessy decision, which talked about separate but equal as the standard. So it was a, it was a pivotal, pivotal time in the country. You know, even though the decision came down, uh, it, 
and, and that was no longer the case. It took many years and several cases later to actually enforce it. It actually took the president to send in the 101st Airborne to escort these children throughout the school, which seems shocking today that you would need the Army to, uh, especially the 101st Airborne, to come down and escort little children around the school. You know, it, it, it just defies, you know, explanation, you know, how, how we can get to this point. But this is where we were as a country trying to write this incredible stain on our country's history. Um, in 1955, Emmett Till was killed in, for allegedly whistling at a white woman. You know, Rosa Parks, at that same, in the same time, in 1955, while riding on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, refused to give up her seat for a white person. Started the whole legal action and resulted ultimately in the, Alabama, the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott. And actually, the, uh, the actual bus, by the way, is in the Henry Ford Museum. If you ever happen to be at the Henry Ford Museum, you can see the actual bus. They actually acquired that particular bus, and it's in the museum now. But nonetheless, uh, in 56, as a result of these bus boycotts, you know, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.'s house was bombed. Things started to spiral downward, a bit out of control. You know, there was another landmark case, uh, Cooper versus Aaron in 58, where people tried to stop this whole change and the case said listen the threat of mob violence isn't in fact enough to stop desegregation you know so they were really trying to work on many different fronts in order to try to preserve the system which which was uh, which was very difficult and during this whole period as dr bales mentioned um, the jim crow laws were were in effect in many parts of the country and although they did, you know, they, they did reach into voting, which is a key factor and, and reaches to the underpinnings of our, you know, of our, of our country, it did affect many, many other aspects of life. And these laws extended from the 1880s through the 1960s. And they were basically intended to maintain a separation between the races. And you would, you would think that, you know, how many, how many ways could they uh, say that? But the list is absolutely... I don't want to say endless, but it's near endless. And just some of them, I mean, I have, I have scads of paper here. And all, there's also a, um, a Jim Crow mo Museum, if anybody's interested, at Ferris State University, if you're ever up in, I think it's uh, Minnesota. Uh, but they have all types of, you know, information on, on things that happened during this Jim Crow period. But they talked about nurses, you know, whether or not nurses can tend to certain people, how buses can be used and how people can use buses in public transportation. Railroads, of course, like Plessy. Who can sit in which cars? Restaurants, of course. You know, what doors you use, where you sit. Toilet facilities, even billiard rooms. Intermarriage, of course, seems shocking today that there'll be laws against who you could marry. Oops, the dreaded bell. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, I mean, look, even burial. And there was, interesting, there was an interesting little blurb how people lose burial records, you know, because you're, you're not allowed to be buried in certain cemeteries that you might normally want to go into. It, it just extends into everything. So, you know, when you start to look at this, you realize how entrenched the system was and how, how it affected everybody's lives on almost a micro level. So, you know, it's really a system that needed to be dismantled. And, you know, thank goodness, uh, you know, we were able to do that, you know, and we, we haven't really won the entire battle, but we're, we've made a lot of progress since then. I thank you very much. Our next speaker is Professor Kathleen Larkin. Professor Larkin is a graduate of St. John's University School of Law. She served for five years as an assistant district attorney in the, in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Professor Larkin maintains a law practice in Suffolk County, New York. Her practice is a general practice which includes criminal defense work for indigent clients. Prior to teaching at Queensborough Community College, Professor Larkin taught at St. Joseph's College in Patrick, New York. She began teaching at Queensborough in January 2010 and teaches business law, principles of finance, and business organization and management. Mm -hmm. Professor Larkin will discuss legal developments in the 1950s and 1960s leading up to the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Professor Larkin. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> in picking up on what Professor um, Hamill said, 
Um, again, the, the law of the land in the 1950s through the, 19, through the beginning of the 1960s was the law of Plessy v. Ferguson, which meant that in any public accommodations where any public funding was involved, that as long as things were equal, that is, as long as blacks were provided with a bathroom, with a place to eat, with a place to go to school, with public transportation, they could be kept away from whites. So we had whites only facilities and blacks only facilities. And uh, my particular focus is going to be on education. What happened was, and when I'm talking about education, I'm talking about kindergarten through public university. So as long as your state supported uh, university had an alternative for black folks to go to, you were okay. So what happened was post uh, Civil War grew up uh, what we now call historically black colleges and universities. So for example, if you were a student in, the, in Maryland, you were a white student, you could go to the University of Maryland. You were a black student, you had to go to a Coppin State, a Morgan State, or some other university that allowed black students to go to. And as long as that was done, then that was okay. A few of the early cases, uh, 1936 for example, the state of Maryland was ordered to elect a black student into their law school, not on the basis of integration versus segregation, but because they did not have a law school for black students. Uh, the same thing occurred in 1938 in Missouri, 1948 in Oklahoma. Uh, and in 1950, the state of Texas came up with an idea. They decided they were going to build a law school for black students rather than allow them into the University of Texas law school. The Supreme Court in 1950 said, no, you can't do that. You have to allow them in to the white, whites only. So those early cases really laid the groundwork, if you will, for Brown versus the Board of Education, which became really the landmark case that we all know as uh, the beginning, if you will, of integration in public schools. Uh, again, as, as Professor Rosen said, that case came out of Topeka, Kansas, a third grader, Linda Brown, in 1951, who actually lived in an integrated neighborhood but couldn't go to the school there because it was a whites-only school, so she had to be bused. They added together uh, cases out of South Carolina, Delaware, Virginia, and Washington, D.C and basically changed the law, setting a new precedent uh, by a unanimous decision uh, based on the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment stating that the fundamental goal was to provide opportunity for educational equality. And really the goal was to dismantle segregated public schools. Uh, with respect to Washington, D.C., they basically just sort of said, well, what we say about the states has to hold as well for the federal government. Our expectation is the same. Now, in doing the case of Brown versus the Board of Education, uh, at a time when approximately 30 to 40 percent of Americans believed in integration, uh, so it really was, in, in some respects, it was the Supreme Court um, paving the way for social change. Uh, they couldn't rely on case law because case law had already said that separate was fine as long as it was equal. So they relied really on social science. And Thurgood Marshall was one of the leading uh, attorneys for the plaintiffs. And they actually brought in psychologists and looked at psychological studies, uh, including dolls of different color, and basically having little girls look at dolls and, and what they saw was that they always gave all the good qualities to the white doll and the lesser qualities to the black doll. They had boys of color, gave them crayons to, to color themselves, to color a picture of yourself, and the boys always would color, use a crayon that was actually lighter than their own skin color to color a self-portrait. So what they said was that the, the exclusion of black children from going to school with white children had created a sense of inferiority among black students that could not be compensated for later in life. Uh, they said, the Supreme Court said, that it was affecting the hearts and the minds of these children and dooming them to a lifetime sense of inferiority and doing damage that could not be undone. And it was really based on that that they changed the law and said that separate means 
unequal. Uh, and, and basically saying that we had to integrate the schools. A year later, in, in a case that's known as Brown II, uh, the Supreme Court then said that we are going to use the federal district courts, the lower federal district courts, to ensure that the states comply with this. And basically telling the states, because of course you know the states are the ones who run the schools and the school districts, that they were going to uh, comply with all deliberate speed. Uh, that was a term that the South basically decided meant we'll do it when we feel like it. Uh, in 1958, Cooper versus Anderson, uh, a case that's called, uh, referred to as the Little Rock Nine, in September of 1957, nine black students tried to enroll in a white high school in Arkansas, in Little Rock. Uh, they were stopped by the Arkansas National Guard. Uh, the president then sent in federal National Guard troops, and they did integrate. However, by February, there was such turmoil in schools uh, in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, that the governor asked for two and a half years to integrate them. Uh, the case of Cooper v. Anderson was decided in September of 1958, where basically the Supreme Court again said, no, you don't have two and a half years. We want it done now. And you cannot change your laws uh, to circumvent our ruling. Uh, again, relying this time on the supremacy clause in the United States Constitution, saying that states cannot override a federal court decision. Uh, the resistance that was met, you know, again, just some other cases. In 1956, in the state of Virginia, the governor, Stanley, came up with a plan of called massive resistance. Uh, in 1959, that actually led to the first public school system closing down. Prince Edward County in Virginia, rather than integrate, shut down their public school system. Gave vouchers so that white students who could afford to went to uh, private schools, leaving basically an entire black population without a, without a school system. It wasn't until 1964 that that case was decided after threatening school officials with prison. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, said to them they had to do it and they agreed to reopen the public school system in June of 1964. Uh, some other cases that, uh, that were going on at the same time or some other um, things that were happening. Between the late 50s to 1963, there did begin to be a groundswell of public opinion um, so that you know the time was ripe for the uh, Civil Rights Act. But in 1960, we had Ruby Bridges who tried to integrate and did integrate the schools in New Orleans. A six-year-old who spent her entire first grade alone because none of the white parents would let their kids go to school with her. Um, we have, in 1963, two students at the University of Alabama uh, facing the governor there, whose motto was segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. Again, brought with U.S. Marshals uh, and an assistant U.S. attorney to integrate the University of Alabama. Uh, in 1962, we have um, a student uh, at the University of Mississippi, the same thing. The important thing that I think you need to understand is, um, and, and that, you, that can't be lost on all of this, is we're talking about lawyers doing great things in courtrooms and the Supreme Court justices doing wonderful work. But you have to understand that what set the tone for this and what made this happen was a little girl in New Orleans, was a little girl in Topeka, Kansas, was a, an Army veteran at the University of Mississippi and three young people uh, at the University of Alabama who really paved the way for this. So it was really the youth of America uh, who forced, uh, in my mind, a lot of what happened with the Civil Rights Act. We now would like to call back Professor Bills, who will talk to us about the politics of the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Thank you. Back to the politics. Well, African Americans have switched wholesale to the Democratic Party in the 1930s as a result of FDR's New Deal. They continue to support the Democratic Party in the 1940s and 50s. President Truman integrated the military simply by signing an executive order, and guess what? The world didn't end, just like the world didn't end when gays were accepted into the American uh, military just recently. 
Uh, 1950s, we have a Republican president, former General Dwight Eisenhower, who really, he came out of the uh, Army, he's not particularly interested in civil rights or integration, certainly doesn't think that the uh, government should be proactive. He says, yes, we should integrate, let it happen on its own, let it happen naturally. Uh, but he's not actively against it either. And when he does act to activate the National Guard, he does so to protect executive power, not out of concern for African Americans. But things changed in 1960 because President Kennedy, John Fitzgerald Kennedy was elected. And, and he's a Democrat from the North, from Massachusetts. And he genuinely wants, in his heart, to pass a comprehensive civil rights bill that's going to outlaw segregation. And I always tell my students, history's not black and white, it's gray. Did he do this out of the goodness of his heart? Partly. Did he do this because he knew that he would further cement African Americans to the Democratic <coughs> coalition? Yes. He pushed for it. He gave a nationally televised speech in favor of a comprehensive civil rights bill. He was really working hard towards this. He be befriended the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who deserves all those titles. Uh, he was a minister, he was uh, a PhD, and uh, Jr., his father was a minister and civil rights leader of some note, so that's why we call him the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. President Kennedy made a phone call, pressured a judge to let Dr. King out of jail. But you know what? President Kennedy being friendly to African Americans, he had to run for re-election in 1964. Do you know who was getting mad at him? Southern white Democrats. The South, since the Civil War, the whites in the South have mainly voted Democratic. The party that was really against the Republicans, against the Union. So he's got to go down to Dallas to mend fences with Southern whites. I'm still one of you, vote for me. He's giving speeches before white business groups. I'm okay, yes, I'm friends with Dr. King, but come on, let's vote for me this November, next November, 64. Um, and that's why he's in that motorcade waving to a mostly white crowd when he's assassinated. That's why he's there. And we know what happens in America when the president is killed. The vice president becomes president, and now you've got a Democrat from Texas, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who in his heart knows that segregation is wrong, but also is a politician who knows, we pass this bill, African Americans are gonna vote for the Democrats forever, for decades. Now, he has to fight to get this bill. He can't just do it. Johnson just can't do it. He's the president. You know the Congress makes the laws, and you know the two houses of Congress, and has to pass the House of Representatives and the Senate, and Southern Democrats are blocking it, fighting tooth and nail against the Civil Rights Act. And Johnson has to plead, has to cajole, has to yell at them has to promise I'll come to your district and give a speech. I'll make sure you get that money for that museum you want. He had to use all of his political power to get that bill out of committee in both the House and the Senate to the floor of the House and Senate for a vote where it finally passed in 1964. And a lot of congressmen and senators said they did it, not for Johnson, but as a tribute to the slain former President Kennedy. Now, Johnson did cement African-American voters and liberals uh, to the Democratic Party for the foreseeable future. But when he signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, he turned to somebody and said, you know, we've lost the South for a generation. And he was right. Because white Southerners, who quite frankly were mostly racist and, and still in favor of segregation, started to vote wholesale for the Republican Party. And the uh, Democratic South cracked in the 60s. Republicans uh, used something called the Southern Strategy to make the crack open wide in the 1980s. Go and look up Google Southern Strategy and see how the Republican Party played to white Southerners and their fears of integration to make the South a solid base of support for the Republican Party. You've seen the maps, the red and the blue maps. The South is red. This act is the beginning of the reason why 
the South is red. And the Civil Rights Act of 1964, so profound, so important, uh, really set the tone for political changes that we are living with today. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Professor Leslie Francis. Professor Francis is a graduate of St. John's School of Law. He is admitted to practice law in New York and Connecticut and in the federal courts for the Southern and Eastern Districts of New York. After graduation from law school, Professor Francis joined the firm of Green and Flowers PC at which he was the lead attorney on all resolution trust corporation transactions which the firm handled. Prior to forming his own firm on Long Island, Professor Francis was the managing partner at Chapman and Francis PC, which practiced in real estate, commercial litigation, bankruptcy, matrimonial law, employment discrimination, land use and government procurement of violence sometimes, for certified minority businesses. He has acted as foreclosure commissioner for the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. He has also presented seminars in the New York area on such topics as the purchase and sale of real estate and the formation of basic, basic business entities. Professor Francis began teaching at Queensborough in 2010 and teaches business law and business organization and management. Professor Francis is one of the faculty advisors to the QCC mock trial team. Professor Francis will discuss an overview of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Professor Francis. Thank you. Uh, one of the things you can, you can be sure of when your bio becomes so long that it's more than five minutes, you know you're getting old. <laughs> uh, African Americans certainly were indeed the focus of the uh, civil rights struggle in the Civil Rights Act of 64. However, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 went way beyond just protecting African Americans. Uh, it sought to eliminate employment discrimination with regard to race, color, gender, national origin, and religion. Uh, we define these, these categories as people, or actually we define the people in these categories as protected classes. Uh, race is defined under the 64 Act as white, black, Asian Pacific, and Native American. This is one of my former uh, students pointed out to me. Asian Pacific includes <coughs> Indian continent. So everyone who's of Indian uh, descent is also protected under the race. Uh, as you can see, you know, under this under this act, <laughs> pretty much everyone is is is, uh, is protected. Um, the scope, I mean, the scope of the coverage of the, of the Civil Rights Act, uh, referred to as Title Seven. Uh, is that it applies to employers who employ 15 or more employees, uh, all employment agencies, labor unions with 15 or more members, state and local governments and agencies of state and local governments, and the federal government uh, em employment of, by the federal government itself. Um, there are two theories under which you can bring a, a Title VII employment discrimination case. Uh, two theories are disparate treatment discrimination and disparate impact discrimination. Disparate, in, uh, disparate treatment discrimination uh, is discrimination against a specific group uh, of people based on being in the protected classes. So if an employer is discriminating against a whole group, uh, that would be a disparate treatment discrimination case. Disparate impact discrimination, and the theory behind that is uh, discrimination, I'm sorry, I just got that backwards. Disparate impact is discrimination against an entire group. Disparate treatment is discrimination against a person who is a member of one of the protected classes. Uh, the landmark case with regard to disparate impact is Duke Power Authority versus Briggs arose in South Carolina. Duke Power Authority ran a power plant in uh, South Carolina. And they had a rule where if you wanted to work inside the power company, inside the building, you had to take an IQ test and pass it, and you had to have a high school diploma. If you worked outside of the plant on the grounds of the plant, those two rules did not apply. Uh, African American 
workers at the plant, uh, who were maintenance workers, uh, applied to be work, uh, to be maintenance workers on the inside of the plant, and obviously they were given the, the exams, uh, and they didn't do well on the IQ exam, and most of them did not have high school diplomas uh, because they were busy trying to take care of their family and didn't have the luxury of finishing high school. And because the IQ test was based on not African-American IQ, it was skewed toward uh, the majority white uh, test, uh, they didn't pass that either. So on its face, because it looked like uh, this test applied to everyone across the board, the court finally determined that this had a negative impact with regard to members of a protected class, i.e. African Americans. And so that uh, requirement was thrown out. The other side of that case is that uh, Duke Power couldn't prove why it was necessary to have a high, uh, pass an IQ test and have a high school diploma to do the same job inside the building that you were doing on the outside of the building. So just from that standpoint alone, it didn't make sense, um, and so that was struck down. The other uh, example of disparate impact discrimination that I like to use is in the form of a movie. Uh, it was out many, many years ago, now many, many years ago, starring Charlie Sterron, the movie was entitled North Country, based on a, a factual event uh, that was involved women, female mine workers at a mine in Min northern Minnesota, I believe, and the discrimination that they faced, not only from, the, from their employer, but also from their union and also from their uh, co-workers, male co-workers. Uh, so that, that was a really good display of disparate treatment, uh, disparate impact in terms of discrimination. Um, <clears throat> the remedies that one can seek if you are successful bringing one of these actions is back pay, reasonable attorney's fees, attorneys always like reasonable attorney's fees, uh, equitable relief including reinstatement to your job position or and or uh, seniority, and punitive damages if the discrimination was in fact uh, intentional. With regard to the scope of the Civil Rights Act, as I indicated, it's very broad. It covers everyone under it. There have been cases brought by every shape of, of people that you can imagine. There's been you know, race discrimination cases, discrimination based on color, uh, national origin cases, um, religious cases, lots and lots of cut cases brought with regard to uh, the 64 Act. The 64 Act really, really, Think started the ball rolling in terms of changing our society and the way that we look at each other and how we interact with each other. Prior to the 64 Act, this room would not be populated as it is today. This college would not be populated as it is today. I certainly would not be teaching here as I teach now. So lots of things have changed, and I know a lot of you I speak to young people, and they just don't understand how it could ever have been the way it was in the 60s. Because you, you grew up in a different time. You grew up in a time where you had friends who are of all races. You live in mixed communities. You, know, you, you went to school with people from all races. And the, the whole idea that there, there could be a, a law that separated people based on race is just insane to you. And that's, uh, that shows how far we've come, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, so the 64 Act was certainly uh, one of the seminal acts in our history that really changed the, uh, the, the way that we, we proceeded from that point on. Um, and it really brought us out of the 18th century and into the 20th century. Um, so, and, and most of us on the panel, I believe, most of us, maybe not that um, lived through that, 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 uh, that period. Uh, I told this story when we were meeting. I went to school in Texas. The first time I went away to school, I went to Texas. And I took a plane to Dallas, Texas, changed planes, and took a plane to a place called Tyler, Texas. That had no airport. The plane landed at Tyler, Texas, got off the plane, walked across the, uh, the runway into a little building, and you collected your luggage there. And so that's what I did. I went into the building. It was the first time I've ever been a, a, away from New York State. I've never been in the South before. 
I come out to the front of the building, there's a line of taxi cabs. I go up to the first taxi cab and give him the address of the school and go into Butler Junior College. He said to me, looked right at me and said, I'm not taking you anywhere. And no one else driving the cab is taking you anywhere. You better start walking. So that was 1968 in Texas. So I know firsthand what discrimination looks like and feels like. And it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful not to, be, not to have to deal with that anymore. Thank you. Our next speaker is Professor Linda Meltzer. Professor Linda Meltzer has been teaching business courses, notably business law, finance and business organization and management at QCC since joining the business department in spring of 2009. Professor Meltzer has received her JD in 2006 from New York Law School and was admitted to practice and was admitted to practice of law in 2007. Obtaining her law degree added to Professor Meltzer's Master of Business Administration MBA from Baruch College in 1987 and her BA from Lehman College in 1976. Most of Professor Meltzer's course has been spent as an equity at, as an equity analysis working on Wall Street for two investment banks, notably Drexel, Burnham, Lambert, and UBS. Professor Meltzer is one of the faculty advisors to the Business Society. Professor Meltzer will discuss some of the leading cases decided under the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the 1960s. Professor Meltzer. Thank you. If, uh, if you didn't get a lump in your throat like I did uh, listening to Professor Francis, um, I'd be surprised. Um, I was too young to understand the Civil Rights Act of 1964, but I do recall uh, watching and remembering how moved my parents were, especially my mother who was a Holocaust survivor and had suffered her own discrimination. Now, following up on the Civil Rights Act of 1964, I do want to point out there were many attempts at a Civil Rights Act uh, in 19th century, but they failed, overturned because Congress um, lacked the power to prohibit discrimination in the private sector. Um, they were stripped of any possible legislation or their ability to protect civil rights. But in 1964, the act um, gave back some of that strength by using the Commerce Clause. Uh, the Commerce Clause is essentially the, uh, the uh, right to regulate interstate commerce between states. So that gave Congress the ability um, on the basis of regulating Congress on an interstate basis. And this didn't mean that in 1964 we went to flash cut accommodative um, um, attitudes uh, among U.S. and particularly in the South. Uh, the two cases I'm going to talk about together are Heart of Atlanta Motel versus the U.S. and Katzenbaum Katzenbach versus McClung, and I'll speak about them together. Um, they were the, about the first cases right out of the box in 64, and then I'll switch over to Loving versus Virginia, a different kind of case. In both of the cases I mentioned, they um, referred to what is called pom public accommodation discrimination and dealt with Title II of the Civil Rights Act, which read, that all persons shall be entitled to the full and equal enjoyment of the goods, services, facilities, privileges, advantages, and accommodations of any place of public accommodation, essentially forbidding discrimination in places of public accommodation. For those of you who saw recently the movie uh, 42 about the young ball player Jackie Robinson, um, who was a star and yet could not stay with the rest of the ball field in the motels. Uh, the heart of Atlanta Motel is very similar to that. In that case, um, it was uh, the motel was in the uh, 
um, Atlanta, Georgia, near the interstate highways, and 75% of the customers were interstate travelers. Um, and like many other motels in the South, um, black Americans were not allowed uh, to rent any kind of rooms. And um, that uh, was dealing with motels. In the McClung case, it was dealing with a restaurant. Different facts, but same theme. Uh, local businesses selling services to interstate. And it dealt with a restaurant called Ollie's Barbecue, um, which catered to families in white collar, white collar being uh, the business trade. They allowed blacks to order takeout, but not to eat in the restaurant, even though two thirds of the workers there were black. And so they too refused to serve black Americans. And um, in one of the um, first uh, challenges, um, Justice Clark in a nine to zero uh, decision um, essentially um, made it unanimous that uh, that the Commerce Clause allowed Congress to regulate these private businesses and so um, pretty much opening the way for other businesses, motels, restaurants, movie theaters, um, anything where there are retail businesses serving the public to opening on a non-discrimination um, basis. These weren't the only retail businesses, of course, that uh, were um, not accommodating black customers. So this was the beginning of that. And as Professor Hamill said, the 60s were a period of revolution and public, and the beginning of protests, student protests against, against war, uh, rights, African American rights, civil rights, um, women's rights, and so forth. And there was a greater acknowledgement of that. I do want to talk about Loving versus Virginia. It was a different case, it was decided in 67, and this one um, dealt with racial discri discrimination and right to marry. Um, Mildred Jeter and Richard Loving lived in Virginia and loved one another. Uh, Mildred was black, Richard was white, and they were married in D.C. in 1958. So after getting married, they went back to Virginia. And soon after, uh, they were arrested when the police broke into their home, actually their bedroom, and wanted to know why they were together. They pointed out the marriage certificate they had gotten. But like many other states, Virginia had what was um, an anti-racial uh, um, a ban against interracial marriages. Uh, they were they were disallowed, and the Lovings um, actually were treated like criminals. They were arrested. They were sentenced to a one year in jail by the trial judge. However, he suspended the sentence if they would leave Virginia and not return together for 25 years. There were 16 other states that had similar laws. But what is so disturbing, and it's not that long ago, and we do have issues like same-sex marriage um, nowadays, is that uh, what the trial judge said. He said, Almighty God created the races, white, black, yellow, Malay, and bread, and he placed them in separate continents. And but for the interference with his arrangement, there would be no cause for the marriage. The fact that he separated the races, the races should mean he intended for the races not to mix. So the Lovings let, left, um, and they went to D.C. for five years, uh, but then they awoke and decided to challenge on the basis of the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment goes back to, um, all the way back to 1868, and uh, decided to challenge on the basis of both equal protection and also due process, which deals with not only the discrimination, uh, but the right to travel from where they were married in D.C. to Virginia, and then also the right to marry. These are basic fundamental rights. And uh, using the strict scrutiny, because it dealt with um, suspect classifications based on race, uh, Justice Clark found not only no legitimate uh, purpose and certainly no compelling reason to justify this racial classification and uh, overturned uh, the Virginia uh, 
the uh, ban against interracial marriages. But it is worth knowing that it's only last year that the same-sex marriages in Windsor versus U.S. allowed the recognition of same-sex marriage um, more than 35 years after the Loving uh, case. So I just wanted to mention that. I didn't get the bell. I must have under-talked my nine minutes. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Our next speaker will be Professor Joseph Dobowski. Professor Joseph Dobowski obtained his bachelor's degree from Queens College, City University of New York, a Juris Doctor degree from St. John's University, and a Master's in Law from New York University. Professor Dobowski began his career as a staff attorney serving the poor of the City of New York through the legal services program initiated by President Johnson's Great Society program. Professor Dobowski is a member of the Bar of the State of New York as well as the Bar of the State of Florida. He has had a long career specializing in litigation and commercial transactions. Professor Dobowski teaches business law and business organization and management in the business department. Professor Dobowski. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It is my privilege to be here. I have been asked to talk about a couple of cases that involve directly admissions to universities. The first case is the case of a young man named Alan Backey, which was decided in 1978. Alan Backey had applied to the University of California Medical School at Davis on two separate occasions. He was a young man who did well in undergraduate school. He was a Marine Corps officer, served four years in the Marine Corps, uh, and a tour of duty in Vietnam during the course of the war. He had applied to the school on two separate occasions, and he was rejected. His application was superior to some of the students who were accepted. Uh, there was a quota which was set up by the University of California in an effort to provide affirmative uh, action and assistance to minority students. The criteria was set at 16%. There were 100 seats, 16 seats were reserved for minority students. Mr. Backey could not apply for those seats. He was not eligible, he was not a, he was not a minority student. He, took a case up to the court in California. The California court struck down the uh, University of California quota system. The case went up to the United States Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court effectively uh, supported the opi opinion of the lower court. However, the court in an effort to protect the consideration of race in the application process in, in universities, uh, set forth the following. Justice Powell, who wrote the opinion, the prevailing opinion, stated, in enjoining petitioner from ever considering the race of any applicant, however, the court below failed to recognize that the state has a substantial interest that legitimately may be served by a properly devised admissions program involving the competitive consideration of race and ethnic origin. For this reason, so much of the California court's judgment as enforcing, as enjoining petitioner from any consideration of race of any applicant must be reversed. Effectively, the court said, the way they did it was wrong, but the court was leaving open the opportunity for the, for the universities to consider race. Uh, Justice Powell further said, there should be a compelling governmental interest in using race. The program must be necessary or narrowly tailored to achieve that interest. Powell found that the educational benefits of diversity were a compelling governmental interest justifying the use of race as a plus factor in admissions. 
Powell said that race can be considered as one of many factors and can influence admissions decisions when the university is trying to achieve overall diversity. Effectively, quotas were out. The status quo stayed for a period of time until we come to 2003 when a couple of cases come up with the University of Michigan. The case of Gratz versus Bell Bollinger and the case of Gruder versus Bollinger. In Gratz, the University of Michigan established a point system. There were 150 points that were established per applicant. They had the opportunity to achieve that many points. And 20 points was set out for a minority student. Justice Rehnquist, who wrote the decision, said the University of Michigan violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment by using an overly mechanical system as a way to include race in the admission system. Gruder versus Bollinger was also a University of Michigan case. The, the uh, Supreme Court narrowly upheld the decision to allow colleges and universities to use race as a component of their admission policies. They were permitted to do so in a now narrowly tailored use as it is furthered as it has furthered the compelling interest in obtaining the educational benefits that flow from a diverse student body. Effectively, the court recognized that the state has an interest in having a diverse student body, that there is advantage in having diverse student body, and that using diversity as a portion of the application process is permitted. And this has, until we will hear of the most recent cases, has stood as the criteria utilized by the universities. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lois Foreman, Esquire. Ms. Foreman is the Director of Labor Relations at QCC. She is an attorney and has previously practiced law. Ms. Foreman will discuss what remedies, as, what remedies a person has today if they believe they are or have been the victim of discrimination. Thank you. Um, I feel a little bit like I'm out of my league here because although I'm an attorney, I'm the only person who's not a professional professor or teacher, so if I'm doing a little more reading than everybody else, please forgive me. Um, my background is primarily uh, in litigation, and I've spent a fair amount of time in working in employment discrimination, both on the plaintiff's and defendant side. Sorry. Better? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, I graduated from Northwestern University undergrad and uh, Hofstra uh, Law School, where I was the editor-in-chief of the Hofstra Labor Law Journal. I also worked at the Legal Aid Society, and from there on was working in the private sector. Um, it's great that all of these laws have been passed, but obviously the next question is, how are they enforced? Um, you've heard a lot about cases, landmark cases, um, which have been passed, but what does an average individual do if they feel that they have been discriminated against based on their race or age or gender or religion or a number of other protected areas? Um, the two areas that I'll be addressing here are discrimination in education and in employment. I'm trying to find the sweet spot here for this mic. Um, the, uh, the Civil Rights Act, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, applies to both employment and education. Um, first of all, it helps to get a general definition of what constitutes race discrimination. Uh, race discrimination involves treating someone unfavorably because he or she is of a certain race or because of personal characteristics associated with race. Um, it can also involve treating someone unfavorably because the person is associated to or married to a person of a certain race or color or because of a person's connection with a race-based organization or group, or an organization or group that's generally associated with people of a certain color. Um, discrimination can occur even when the victim and the person who has been discriminated against are of the same race or color. As I have discovered, there have been many discrimination cases where the discriminator 
is the identical race and or gender of the person, but they still feel that they've been treated unfairly. Um, the first area I'd like to speak to you about is education. That's probably most relevant to you at this point. Um, Title VII applies to private and public colleges and universities. These laws extend to all state education edu agencies, elementary and secondary schools, colleges, vocational schools, proprietary schools, um, libraries, and museums that receive U.S. Department of Education funds. Um, and examples of illegal discrimination would be a teacher disciplining or grading the student differently based on their race or other factors, um, being denied, students being denied opportunities such as scholarships or extracurricular activities, classmates who were harassed or bullied because of their race, um, or people who were otherwise qualified students who were denied admission based on their race. Um, it's also important to know that it's illegal to discriminate against somebody because they have opposed illegal discrimination or filed a complaint or assisted in an investigation. This is called retaliation and the law protects people who oppose such illegal practices. Now, what do you do if you feel you've been discriminated against? Uh, a primary vehicle, which is free, uh, I should back up. What to do if you have been discriminated? First thing you should do is actually try to deal with it internally at the, at the educational institution. Don't necessarily run to an agency, but each, each institution does have an affirmative action officer who you can speak with who will try to um, find out what's happening and, and correct whatever the problem might be. If you feel that that's not satisfactory, you do have the right to go to administrative agency, specifically the Office for Civil Rights. Um, they're under the authority of the U.S. Department of Education and their purpose is primarily focused on uh, protecting civil rights in the field of education. Um, they, and they deal with allegations of discrimination based on race, color, national origin, sex, age, or disability in both private and public programs that receive federal funds. Um, if you feel that you've been treated unfairly or, or you've been denied access to a program, and the reason is because of your race, among other things, um, you can go to the Office of Civil Rights and um, basically they will have you fill out a complaint form where you'll be explaining why you feel you've been treated unfairly on the basis of being of a part of a protected class. In this case, we're talking about race. Um, the OCR will then do an investigation. They'll contact the educational institution. They'll interview people who would have information about it, review documents. Uh, and they may also look at some statistical information to see whether there might be a pattern of the same type of conduct that's going on. Uh, if they conclude that your, your claim is valid, they'll issue a, a finding in your favor, or they might attempt to resolve the matter by working out a settlement agreement. Uh, again, the, as I said before, the law prohibits educational institutions from retaliating against you because you've exercised your rights to file a complaint of discrimination. Uh, if that were to happen, then you would file a separate complaint, uh, uh, a complaint, and the title would be, say, you were retaliated against, and those would be two separate complaints. Uh, the, uh, uh, in, other than the OCR, you, as you've heard, you also would have the right to in, uh, initiate a private lawsuit in based federal or state court. Uh, in public schools, you would have to first go through an administrative agency and file a complaint there before they would allow you to file the, the lawsuit. If it's a private school, um, you, don't, you don't have to go to an agency first. You can file a complaint in court directly. Uh, I guess the benefit of the OCR is that you don't need to have a lawyer. There's no cost to it, and you can just go ahead and file your complaint. In the area of employment, uh, Title VII applies to private employers, labor unions, and employment agencies. 15 or more employees. Uh, it, it prohibits discrimination in recruitment, hiring, wages, assignment, promotions, benefits, discipline, discharge, layoffs, and almost every aspect of employment. Uh, discriminatory practices would include biases in hiring, promotion, job assignment, termination, compensation, retaliation, and various types of harassment. Most of the employment discrimination laws are covered under federal and state statutes, but there are also city laws. If you feel that you've been discriminated against in employment because of your race or you feel that you've 
been unfairly denied a promotion or raised or were terminated, you have several avenues that you can pursue. You can file a complaint with the EEOC, which is the equal, U.S. Equal Opportunity Commission, U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which is a five-member bipartisan commission whose mission is to eliminate unlawful employment discrimination. Um, and looking up the background, uh, no more than three of the five commissioners can be of the same uh, political party. If you want to file a complaint with the EEOC, it's similar to with the OCR. You can go there, file the complaint, they will look into it and either issue a finding or give you a letter called a right to sue letter, which would then allow you to go to court and sue privately. Um, you can also file a similar complaint with the New York State Division of Human Rights, where the process is very similar. Um, as far as relief is concerned, uh, what if, you, if you prevail in an employment discrimination case, um, basically the relief is intended to make you whole, put you back in the place you were in before, which could include back pay, front pay, hiring, promotion, tenure, or reinstatement. There are also some monetary awards available. Um, in addition, there's a New York City Commission of Human Rights, which you could also go to. Uh, again, these are all state and city agencies, or of course, bring a private law school, uh, a lawsuit in court. So, those are those are your options. And um, I think without these enforcement actions, the laws that are on the books, unfortunately, would probably just be laws on the books. Our next speaker will be Professor Ted Rosen, a graduate of Queens College and New York University School of Law. Professor Rosen is a member of the Bar of the State of New York and various federal courts, including the United States Supreme Court. He has practiced law for more than 38 years. Most of his work has been in the field of commercial litigation in both state and federal courts. He has substantial experience in arbitration, particularly in the financial industry, having served as an arbitrator for more than 25 years for the New York Stock Exchange and the, NA and the NASD, and more recently for the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, or FINRA for short. Professor Rosen began teaching at QCC in 2000 as an, adjunct, as an adjunct and became full-time in 2006. He teaches business law and principles of finance and, and is one of the faculty advisors to our mock trial team. Professor Rosen will discuss several recent cases. Good afternoon. Uh, the concern today by civil rights lawyers and those that bring cases on behalf of people claiming to have been discriminated is that the Supreme Court is increasingly making it harder for them to be successful in those cases. And I'm going to quickly try to go through several recent cases which I think illustrate that. First case is the case of Ritchie in 2009 where this majority in the Supreme Court held in favor of white firefighters in New Haven, Connecticut who claimed that they were the victim of, vic of racial discrimination because they were not promoted after passing a test for lieutenant and captain. The city was about 60% black and Latino at the time, and the city officials tossed out the results of the test because the only firefighters who passed it were white. The Supreme Court decided in favor of the firefighters. Uh, there were those, those legal observers who saw that as a weakening of the Civil Rights Act. Last year, uh, several cases came down from the Supreme Court uh, involving discrimination claims where the Supreme Court favored the employer. University of Texas versus Nassar, University of Texas Southern West Medical Center versus Nassar. Question there was retaliation, just as Ms. Foreman referred to. Uh, Mr. Nassar claimed that he was denied permanent employment at a medical center after he complained about discrimination. And the issue in that case was how do you prove that? Uh, the, an easier way, a lower standard would be to prove that retaliation was a motivating factor, one of maybe other factors. Uh, the harder standard is to prove, to require the plaintiff to prove that he would have gotten the job except for the retaliatory intent, a much higher standard. 
the Supreme Court decided in favor of the employer. Another case that came down around the same time was Vance versus Ball State. Uh, the issue there, there was a discrimination claim. The, the, the issue was who was a supervisor. Uh, whether or not a supervisor is someone with uh, someone who merely directs day-to-day -day activities or a higher standard supervisor is somebody with the power to take, quote, tangible employment action. That, that's a more restrictive defini definition of supervisor. Once again, the Supreme Court decided in favor of the employer. In uh, June of 2013, a very uh, well-known case, Fisher versus University of Texas, uh, this involved uh, 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 affirmative action. Uh, the plaintiff had been a white applicant who was denied admission, and uh, basically uh, she had been rejected for admission to the 2008 entering class. She sued the university, and she sued the school officials, claiming that the university considered race in admission, and that violated the Equal Protection Clause. University won at the district court level. They won at the level of the Court of Appeals. Uh, the Supreme Court sent it, sent it back to the Court of Appeals, saying that they did not apply the correct standard, that there should have been a higher standard that was alluded to before, that of strict scrutiny applied, which would make it, in effect, harder for the uh, university, which had won at the first two levels, to justify its position. Uh, a case that was decided earlier this month, which uh, you may have heard about in the newspapers, involved the University of Michigan. Uh, in Michigan, voters adopted an amendment to the state constitution. They adopted proposal number two, now article number one, section 26, which in relevant part basically prohibited the use of race-based preferences as part of the admissions process to state universities. So Michigan passed an amendment to the state constitution saying that in a state university, the university could not give preference for race, not use different types of affirmative action plans. This was challenged in court. It went up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court held just April 22nd of this month that there is no authority in the federal constitution or in the court's precedence for the courts, the judiciary, to set aside Michigan laws that commit to the voters the determination whether racial preferences may be considered in governmental decisions. So the Supreme Court basically said that Michigan uh, could very well do what it did, you know, amend its constitution to prohibit it, to prohibit any type of race-based preferences. Uh, an interesting case that was argued last month uh, before the Supreme Court, which uh, has not yet been decided, is again a case that you may have heard about, uh, the Hobby Lobby cases, Hobby Lobby case, and this has to do perhaps with the interplay between uh, the affirmative, uh, the Health Care Act, Obama, Obamacare, uh, in the Hobby Lobby case, the Christian owners of a chain of arts and craft stores said that the Affordable Care Act violated their religious beliefs because it forced them to provide birth control methods to employees, that that would violate their religious beliefs. And, and it had, went back, you know, the, the arguments involved going all the way back to the Atlanta Motel case that was referred to by Professor Meltzer. Okay, thank you. That, that case was argued on March 25th, 2014, and uh, has not yet been decided. Just two interesting, or one interest, two interesting fast notes, settlements. California Hospital paid $975,000 just recently, back in March to settle a racial discrimination case where uh, basically the EEOC said the hospital had an English-only language policy that was used to harass and discriminate against Filipino employees in violation of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. 
And you may have known that the New York City Fire Department has been the subject of litigation over its testing for some time. In March, with the new mayor, uh, the city and the fire department and the Justice Department came to a settlement of that long-standing lawsuit. The city will pay about $98 million in back pay and benefits to black and Hispanic people who took civil service exams to become firefighters in 1999 and 2002. Um, and they will implement certain reforms in the fire department to increase the number of minority firefighters. And that settlement was just reached last month. Thank you. We conclude our program with Professor Elaine Thompson. Professor Thompson has a master's in business administration and teaches in the speech communication and theater arts department. She is one of the faculty advisors to the mock trial team and to the business plan team and last week went with them to Albany when they competed in the state finals. Professor Thompson will give us a personal reflection. Thank you. This has been, for me, a very eye-opening discussion. The event, I feel, was very necessary. We learned that 50 years ago, this room would have looked very different. 50 years ago, this campus would have looked very different. Uh, many of us minorities would not have been able to be here. Now granted, Queensboro is a very young college, I believe 55 years old, but I can anticipate that a lot of you are gonna be moving on to the four-year colleges very soon, and you'll be welcome there, which might not have happened had this been 50 years ago and no Civil Rights Act. So the question that I would like to present to you all that are here, students, is what is the next step? What is the next step? So 50 years ago, there were people who sacrificed so that we could walk these halls, so that we could be here at Queensboro and earn our degrees, and in fact teach here at Queensboro. What's the next step? Looking forward, do you have a responsibility? What do you need to be doing? The first thing I'd like to do is commend you all for even being here as students at Queensboro. It's a major step. What I'd like you to do is make a commitment to yourself to take advantage of all of the resources that we have on campus here for you. There's so many. This is a wonderful college. We have faculty that genuinely care about the students. They genuinely care about you. So what I'd like you to do is make an attempt in your final year or semester here to connect with your faculty, right? We can save you so much time, right? We know about internships, scholarships. We can save you sometimes thousands of dollars, but we are not always able to come to you. You have to come to us, make that connection, right? Make a commitment, please, to do that. Tap into your faculty and staff here at Queensboro. We do it because we're passionate about getting you started <coughs> on the right track. And once you graduate from Queensboro, I know many of you already plan on going to four-year colleges. I'd like to see us with 100% transfer to four-year college rate. I'd love to see that happen. Get as much education as you can. Get it as early in life as you can. And my theory is get it for as little cost as you can. Not a lot of student loan debt, which is why CUNY is a wonderful resource. The other thing that I'd like you to do is make sure that you waste no opportunity. Waste no opportunity. There are vast resources here at Queensboro. We travel with various clubs and teams taking you to different campuses. Opportunities that, if you look at the bulletin boards or read your title mail, it's a wonderful way for you to find out other opportunities or things that you can get involved in and will further your career, I can guarantee you. It'll look amazing on your resume. Please do that. Do not waste opportunities. The next thing that I'd like you to do, and I'm going to close this out very soon, um, your colleagues, your classmates, make that connection. We have got a brilliant group of students here in Queensboro. In some of the departments that I've worked with, we've got people that are coming up with new inventions, they're presenting them at business plan competitions and so forth. Make those connections. Some of the people that I went to college with way back when, we're still connected. So make those partnerships, please. The last thing that I'm asking you to do is to find your passion. 
Find something that you feel is your cause and you're willing to invest your time and your effort in. It may be the DREAM Act, which is something that's very close, near and dear to my heart. I speak to students all the time who are not able to take advantage of scholarship opportunities because unfortunately they are here in this country and they're not able to take advantage of that. The DREAM Act would help remedy that scenario. Whatever your cause is, it can be animal, rap, animal rights or it could be advocating for the disadvantages, equal rights, human rights, human trafficking. Find something and get involved, right? And bring someone along with you. If you have a family member, a sibling, cousin, you name it, who you know needs to know about Queensboro, they don't know about all that we have to offer here, tell them about Queensboro. Have them enroll. This will become part of your legacy. It's been shown that the first person who's graduated from college in a family opens the doors for others to take that step, go to college and graduate themselves. I want you, each of you, to make a commitment to leave a legacy so that the next 50 years, when we look back, we will be thanking you, each and every one of you. That concludes our program. We hope you found it informative and that you learned something about the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Please stay here for the Business Department Honor Ceremony, which will take place now.